right, welcome back to Lesson 19, Human Rights. And at the end of this lesson, we'd like you to be a little more aware of some of the motivation behind protests, but also we'd like you to understand the concept of human rights and some of the application of human rights around the world. Let's jump into protests. There's a great quote that I believe could be a part of an essay. You could use this for argumentation, trying to outline you know, what is the responsibility of a citizen when they live under a state that they find to lack justice. An out-and-out out civil resistor argues to himself that a state allows personal freedom only insofar as the citizen submits to its regulations. Submission to the state law is the price a citizen pays for his personal liberty. A citizen who thus realizes the evil nature of a state is not satisfied to live on its sufferance. Thus, considered civil resistance is a most powerful expression of a soul's anguish and an elegant protest against the continuance of an evil state. That language, that clarity of argumentation looks like an E to me. So if you're wondering, how can I get an E for argumentation? You need to begin to take inventory of the arguments presented to you and have those at the ready when you write your diploma exam. You know, you could weave your own argumentation out of those concepts and nuances of that source. It could be brilliant. Here's the same idea, a lot more generalized. Better to die on one's feet than to live on one's knees. Here's that same idea, but illustrated in a cartoon. Protest beyond the law is not a departure from democracy. It's absolutely essential to it. So that's argumentation by Howard Zinn. From that argument, you chose some evidence, maybe with Black Lives Matter and you know, a violation of quarantines and, and you know, martial law and, and curfews and see the importance of Black Lives Matter in 2020. We have some other historic case studies of protest, and there's a link to some protests from Vietnam, and here's a quote from Vietnam. We were taking the black young men who had been crippled by our society and sending them 8,000 miles away to guarantee liberties in Southeast Asia, which they had not found in Southwest Georgia and East Harlem. Now, the disconnect between American foreign and domestic policies during the Civil War, or sorry, during the Civil Rights Movement and during the Cold War um, is illustrated there quite profoundly. This idea of sending individuals off to fight for liberty that they don't get to enjoy at home. Watch them in brutal solidarity, burning the huts of a poor village but we realized that they would hardly live on the same block in Chicago. Wow. Pretty powerful stuff. Now, the right to protest, the right to be disobedient, um, has been important in 2020, but it's also been re-regulated and legislated here in Alberta. So you may want to look at, you know, what are your rights as a protester before you take to the legislative grounds? Here's a review of human rights. The story of human rights is that 10-minute video of the evolution of human rights looking at you know, Cyrus the Great and Hammurabi's Code and all of that great stuff all the way up to the UN Declaration of Human Rights. Um, the link was in a previous one of these lessons. If you didn't watch it then, you need to watch it now. As to is my Prezi on rights. Rather than talking about rights generally, we want you to be able to talk about rights very specifically. We want you to be able to look at a specific right, like the freedom of speech, and be able to really explore why the freedom of speech is an ex essential pillar of democracy. That if you remove the freedom of speech with it, you will destroy democracy. That the freedom of speech is a cornerstone of democracy. But there are times, to borrow the language of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, the preamble, there are times when we might have to reasonably limit the freedom of speech. When is it reasonable to limit the freedom of speech? 
When can we demonstrate that it's reasonable to limit these freedoms, like the freedom of speech, like the freedom of association, like the freedom of movement, like the freedom of assembly, like the right to privacy from government? We want to be specifically able to discuss these on your essay. Here's some other documents that looks at uh, the concept of human rights, big picture, and a nice three-minute video that summarizes them for you. Now, in a related note, but as a bit of an aside, uh, there have been people in, in 2020 that have been protesting and suggesting that uh, during the pandemic, during the lockdown, during the quarantine, um, what has been taken away from them is the right to have a job. And to have a job, to be able to feed your family, to be able to pay for your mortgage or your rent is a human right. And the government regulating um, which businesses are open and which businesses can't be open was a violation of their economic rights. So as an aside, we have this topic, you know, do we have the right to economic activity and economic development? And with that right, are there responsibilities to each other and to the environment? Or does our right to economic development supersede our responsibility to each other and to the environment? Next up, we have an opportunity to look at human rights around the world. And uh, there's a report here about different countries, but we're going to focus on a few specifically like Iran. So to catch up in Iran, there's some articles and a video link. But the main issue we have with the Iranians is public stoning. So back in 2010, Iran Human Rights reported that seven stoning executions had been carried out over the past four years. 14 more were sentenced to death by stoning. 11 of them were women, were pending, and it was highly publicized. Now, clearly stoning is very public, very painful, very prolonged way to execute someone very inhumane and unfortunately Iran's not the only place in the world that still uses stoning but as you can see it's the only place where it's legal you know this is state policy government saying we it's legal and we practice it Hard to discuss human rights and not go to China. So there is a video here on China, but when we look at China, we need something to compare it against, and why not compare it against the United States of America? So a lot of people like to look at America as the land of the free, the home of the brave. But there is something foul in America as well. And that is reported here. And many of you are already aware of it, that U.S. companies are making money, $750 per day per child, to keep immigrant children in prison-like conditions. Are human rights universal? Are human rights universal for non-Americans who have entered America illegally? Or by entering America illegally, have they um, somehow you know, either surrendered, sacrificed, or lost these human rights that are meant to be universal? Here's a cartoon. Anytime you have a cartoon, it's a chance to show off your A1 skills. And it is by a friend of the department, Clay Bennett of the Chattanooga Times Free Press. So first thing, you look at the cartoon, you should be like, oh, what's the context here? So you look at some detail, you see the Olympic rings, and you might be thinking Beijing 2008. Then you might be saying, okay, what's the problem that the cartoonist is trying to, trying to expose? And the problem is we, we see two Chinas, right? We see a public China that's being presented with the, you know, the Olympic rings behind her and, you know, the speakers. And then we see a, a China hidden from the cameras, from, from the, you know, the, the lens of the media. And we see that other China has a different type of existence. So the problem is the idea of hidden human rights abuses in China and there's some chains around that individual's or, or you know, anklets around that individual's feet. So we also can talk about the idea of imprisonment and torture and all those techniques of dictatorship that are being hidden from China during this celebration of the Olympics. Um, so what is the solution that the cartoonist wants? 
Do they want more liberalism? Do they want less liberalism? And what is the vehicle to provide that solution? Do they think it's the Chinese that can that can rectify the situation? Or are they suggesting, being that this is in the Chattanooga Times Free Press and not the Beijing Times Free Press, are they suggesting that there's a role to play by the good people of Chattanooga? That the Chattanoogans um, need to somehow be a part of the solution that is the ideological perspective of this cartoonist. What is the significance of the perspective? And what happens if we don't solve this problem? Is there a division of society? Would there be people that disagree with the perspective being illustrated by Clay Bennett? What's the perspective of the woman in the front as opposed to the perspective of the woman in the back? And what would the government of China be saying at this time? Many perspectives to unlock. Next up, we're going to go to France. We've talked about the Burkini ban already in the past, but there's some photos here to remind you of what was happening. Here's a sign from the government. This is the communication between government and government about their um, expectations about what you can and cannot wear at the beach. You can wear shorts, you can wear one piece, you cannot wear a burkini. Here's a woman uh, being cited for her wearing of a burkini. Very famous photograph now. And here's the response. So many individuals uh, protested her being cited and fined for wearing the burkini. And again, on an A1, you might see a photograph. And if you see a photograph, you need to look at the details within the photograph and say, are there some details here that help me understand the context? Islamophobia is not freedom. Hey, mister, hands off my sister. Clothes, religion, choice. So those photos should, in and of themselves, um, and the fact that some women are wearing bathing suits and there's that big, you know, beach um, inflatable there, and there's, you know, a, a woman wearing what could be uh, a burkini or or maybe a burqa there. Um, we have this idea of, you know, to what extent can or should the government regulate our clothing and our culture? Our expressions of, of our culture. And uh, hey, Mr. Hands Off My Sister is an example of how this is an issue not just for Muslim women, but this is an issue that all women need to address. Is that when government is regulating the public appearance of women, that's an issue for all women, not just for Muslim women who are, who are being regulated. And that's what this photo is showing. Liberty, equality, and not fraternity, but sorority, right? The idea that there's a sisterhood of women of different cultures that need to see how this is an attack against all women. Take off your bikini in Nice. We are helping you against your oppression. So this is one of those case studies where there is still a division of society. There's going to be some people that promote or support the police and that they might argue that there are places in the world where bikinis are used as a weapon against women to keep them uh, objects um, of, of hidden value or objects that are controlled by men. And that still remains the case in some countries. Uh, and this cartoonist is making fun of that perspective. Now here in Canada, um, we don't have a lot of issues with people wearing burkinis. In fact, this cartoon is saying, hey, we even have nude beaches. Yeah. There's some documents there about the French Revolution, if you can't remember much about that. And there's a concept I want you to connect this to, which is laissez-te, and the idea of secularism, and separation of church and state, not only in France, but also in Quebec, with the Quebec Social Charter. Now, some would suggest that forcing the secularism upon society is an attack on faith itself. As you slowly remove church from state, You'll lose some of those fundamentals of one's faith until the end you are left with no faith. In some countries, women have the right to express themselves as they wish. Israel's bikini ban is just as bad as France's burkini ban. So there are some countries where bikinis are the target of uh, the police's aggression. You cannot wear a bikini. 
it's too revealing. And one of those countries is Israel, and that's what's being protested over there. Now, historically, in America, the bikini used to be a subject of controversy as well. Here we have a, a historical footage of a bikini policeman um, at the beach in Washington, D.C., making sure these women are being modest enough. Keep in mind, this is the 1920s. These women could be your great-great-grandmothers, showing a little bit too much knee, I guess. One of the related concepts is plurality and pluralism. That connects back to hyphenated Canadianism and divided loyalties and all those great concepts from 20. We want you to add pluralism and plurality to your uh, lexicon, right, to your vocabulary if you don't already have it. In a related note, uh, do we as consumers, do we as one of the largest economies of the world, do we have leverage? Can we weaponize trade and economics to use as a tool to try to inspire change around the world? In the Philippines, we have seen martial law. Should we be using our Canadian economic connections with the Philippines to try to create change? to the benefit of the citizens if the government is betraying their relationship with those citizens. Now, what responsibility do we have for individuals outside of our borders? Well, historically, Canada famously turned back some Jewish refugees during the Holocaust, and they went back to Europe and died. And there's a connection to that document there. Unfortunately, an NGO called Freedom House is reporting that globally we are seeing an erosion of democratic norms and we're seeing a march of authoritarianism. Donald Trump in America is just one example of a leader who's becoming more and more authoritarian. Maybe when you're watching this in the future, Trump's no longer president and you're like, well, we had an election, dude. You got he, he was voted out and we've got this other guy now. And he's worse. So, oops. Yeah, that's America. Maybe it's Kanye. Hey, did Kanye win? No. Really? I'm pretending to talk to you right now. And hopefully you didn't talk back. Because, you know, it doesn't work. So, what would be the worst places for you to go visit? Well, let's not go to Libya or Somalia or Saudi Arabia uh, Uzbekistan, Sudan, South Sudan, anytime soon. We do have dictatorships and civil war and police states, North Korea. Not sure that's on your, once the pandemic's over, let's go traveling list. So what can we do as responsible citizens? Well, you are a consumer and you can be more careful. You know, you can you know, trace your dollars. You can vote with your dollars. You either vote with your dollars to support human rights or you vote with your dollars to abuse human rights. So where are you buying your clothes from? Can they be traced back to a sweatshop? If so, you are a part of the problem. As I sit here wearing clothes that can be traced back to a sweatshop, I'm not saying I'm not a part of the problem. I'm just saying that collectively we are a part of the problem. And... At the end of the source, or at the end of the document, we have some essays. In each one of these essays, you should be able to look at them and say, okay, what's the problem that's being um, you know, highlighted? What is the solution that's being offered? What are the values attached to this solution? How does this solution connect to either individualism or collectivism? Uh, who would promote this ideological perspective? Is there any evidence to further it? Uh, maybe some philosophy to further it? Is there anybody that would argue against it? What's the flaws of the logic and the bias? And ultimately, what's the significance? Why must we find a solution to this problem? Practice those essays and then move on to the next lesson.